Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Between Two Brokers. This is part two. Uh, We are 20 South Battery in Charleston, South Carolina, a Charleston mansion that is over 15,000 square feet, five stories. You've probably seen it if you have been to Charleston, and we are joined today again by medium Haley Lowe Fennell and architectural historian, Brittany Lavelle Tula. Thank you ladies for joining us. So let's get on some different topics. Um, I am curious, Haley, so I actually stayed here probably 10 years ago and I knew that it was, so this is a historic end. Um, And obviously Brittany says it has been since the 1970s, I think. So I knew all of the lore of ghost stories and that's what made me choose to stay here because I wanted to um, see a ghost. Are you chill? Oh yeah. Oh, no, I, have a head. <laughs> <laughs> I like to have new experiences. Um, and I came and stayed here and I was terrified. Like I, I you know. Um, it's hard and, not to be. Yeah. And so I, 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 that's all I really remember. I didn't see any ghosts, but I definitely heard stuff, of course. You know, it's like I was just like waiting for the ghost to come in and get me. Uh, <laughs> so you were talking about energy. And and um, another thing I was talking to my boyfriend last night about when I went to visit a con- concentration camp in Germany when I was young. And the second that we got off of the bus, you know, this feeling of death. I mean, I had never experienced it before. Not hadn't seen anything. I hadn't seen any exhibits or anything like that. But just the darkness and depth of death was constant the entire time that we were here. So I want you to just kind of talk about energy and you talk about some people can turn it on and off. Can you see a ghost? Have you seen a ghost? Go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It's um, definitely spaces and places hold energy. So there's also a house that's kind of near here. It's on Broad Street that um, I have a friend that lives in the carriage house, and she occasionally will hear a footprint on the back porch, um, kind of like a horse just kind of nodding, but putting its hoof on the porch. Um, and clearly there's no horses back there now. But yeah, by all means, the houses, places, um, especially places where there is a lot of death, um that will hold a lot of that emotion still we're also going into those places like i love that you came here with the intent to see a goat (laughs) and so when we do something like that or when we visit historical places historic places uh we're going in with kind of the stories that are already in our head for i already a little bit open to perceiving anything that's on the other side and that usually just starts with energy so just like a feeling that's inside If we can kind of move past that feeling or, um, and the only way to move past it is to acknowledge it. Like, okay, I feel a lot of in other, and this place is very impactful. um, A lot of things happened here. We can kind of then go ask the next question if we want. So we can either shut it down or go ahead and ask the next question, which would be, okay, is there anybody here that wants to tell me something that wants to connect in with me? Is there anything that I can learn from this place and we'll tend to get those answers in our head so it's not so much seeing ghosts right there and then at that time but it's more kind of listening to what's going on internally to get those messages so when i sit down for one on one reading i don't see anyone it's not like a physical manifestation that happens out of nowhere it's my imagination that i let take course and I just trusted enough to give the messages kind of through my imagination to my sitter, which is what I would call the person that I'm reading for. Whenever I've seen a ghost has always been at night, uh, occasionally out of like my peripheral vision in a doorway or something like that. Um, but our senses tend to be a little bit like our human senses kind of tend to be a little bit dampened at night. Therefore, like our sort of otherworldly senses start to open up one because we're tired two because of everything that we've been taught since growing up that's when ghosts come visit <laughs> it's nighttime um and it just gets quieter so we're not talking to anyone when i lay down in bed is kind of when i get the most information that's when i did the intention to get information about this house i just kept a notebook nearby and wrote down little notes about the house 
Um, I know I probably went off on a tangent there a little bit. No, help not me. at all. I have a little question okay. for you. So yeah. when we do these house histories, obviously everyone died in their homes prior to, you know, the early 20th century where people were coming to hospitals and whatnot. I mean, the guy who built this house, Samuel Stevens, he dies in this house only a few years later and he dies of constipation. Which sounds um, not nice. nice. Yeah. yeah. We also know his sister or sister is a mother, dies of old age in the house. We know that Sarah Simons, her husband dies of a botched surgery in, and he's also a doctor inside the house. And so the people are also being born here. So how, I mean, if you have a homeowner or when I talk to homeowners, they name went down. I mean, the answer is always yes. You know, if it's of a certain age, how does that energy fit in? I mean, are there different levels of whether it's a traumatic death or just it's all death same. or yeah, that's a great question. I, honestly, it's all the same. We we get more fearful about a dramatic death, and we tend to hang on to those stories a little bit closer. Therefore, those are the ghosts that come a little bit closer because we've let our awareness reach out to them. Mm -hmm. So we're like, ooh, like I want to see if anything's in this room. Um, these are the stories that I know. Those typically tend to be the ghosts that come closer. I open up my door quite wide and I'm like, okay, well, who else is there? Like sometimes I'll get that first ghost that maybe I know the most about. And then I'll think, all right, well, who's behind you? Um, who else is prominent to this house or this person that I'm sitting with? Who else wants to come forward and kind of give a message or say a little something? That's a choice that I make. Nobody has to do that. Uh, but that's one way that you can perceive a little bit more than just the first stories that are kind of coming forward. But yeah, by all means, like not even people that have died here are here. So anyone that has, uh, I think you mentioned that someone, Richard, passed away in New York. Mm -hmm. He can, he's still here though, right? And so they don't necessarily, they're no longer confined by time or space. So they can be anywhere and everywhere and with anyone at all times. Yeah. Impressive. Well, I, I I don't know if you want to get into this now, but there was there's one story that I mean, yes, there's the carriage house and the um, the I don't know if you heard this of the Civil War soldier. I mean, there's a lot of Richard Lathers comes up, but there's one story of a young man in his early 20s who dies here in in the 20th century of a horrible suicide. Um, and he, what we know today, it was probably schizophrenia, but back then they hadn't diagnosed it very well. And, um, he had, I think a traumatic, we know this because Dr. Schaefer has this boatload of letters of the Pringle family of what's happening with Nell McCall, uh, Pringle and trying to save the house and what happens to the family after her death and Ernie Pringle, um, he jumps from the staircase. You now a lot of records say he jumps out of a window, but we know that his older sister, Duncan, and you know, they call her Dunk. She becomes one of the, actually the first female uh, pediatricians in Charleston. Mm -hmm. Pediatricians are a doctor. I'll have to fact check that in my report. But she, she says she, they were playing cards downstairs and he had his, he had over the years after his mother died. So definitely a traumatic event had triggered maybe this kind of rekindling of status mental status and he had outbreaks but he was doing well at this point and they were playing cards and they went up to bed and all of a sudden she heard what sounded like a chest of drawers hitting the bottom floor of the foyer and it was her brother he died of a fractured skull mm -hmm. from jumping i think it was like almost a year after his mother's death and so i don't know if he ever comes up i don't know if that is that all the energy that i've heard is, has been in the back of the outbuilding but and for me, when I think about haunted house and ghost stories, this traumatic Harvard graduate who could never please his father, who loved his mother, had these outbreaks and his mother dies and he jumps. Yeah, that feels more like when I first walked in the house, more this house, right? That's what you're saying. Like not until that uh, rooms out back could be this house. And that is how some of the women that you're talking about. But yeah, it's like I'm walking in the door and I can kind of pick up on like three, the three women spirits and then like one or two males in this house. Um, he like that, just when you're telling the story, he just like kind of rises up to this room and is here with us. Um, sometimes maybe it's not the people, the people that are coming to visit, uh, maybe they're not really connecting in with him first of all, because they're staying out in the carriage house and they're not here. And so their perception is, well, I wouldn't necessarily connect in with him. If anyone wanted to, they can open up their perception enough 
to receive him just like I could at my own house. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, But by all means, he's still here. There's also kind of a difference between who we are here in this life and then who we become once we pass away. When we pass away and we're trying to connect in with people that are still here, we'll start to give them the information that they already know about. So we'll give them the information about like their passing or the playing playing cards or um, anything that really feels relevant to them at the time and like the feelings that they would have had. And then as soon as we get to, okay, well, who are you now? Or how can you come in and talk with me now? They kind of turn to who they are in spirit, which really is more of a neutral being. Um, I don't like to describe it as like negative or overly positive. It's just more neutral. They by all means kind of miss the human life that they had because there's nothing like um, suffering. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you find it. But it's funny to say they actually, it's like kind of one of the reasons why we decide to come back life after life after life is for the adventure of it. Because yeah, it was, for lack of a better word, kind of boring on the other side. They like to be there and they like to support us and they like to see everything that we're going through, but they don't get to like hug people or be mad and people or be really happy. Me. Um, oh, that's him. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, so he he feels like he's here, and he feels very, um, this is a funny word for it, but he just gives me the word satiated on the other side. Like, he feels good and calm and, like, would be clear of mind now. They also can see the effect that they had in the life, uh, the life that they had and the effect that they had on the people in their lives. Um, so there's a little bit of sorrow for that, but then also, like, the sense of, and now I get to kind of move on and do the next things, um, both in spirit and would be into his next life, too. So he, or can we imply that he's like chosen not to come back into this life because it's like really for him kind of a relief to be on the other side? Okay, so it's going to get like a little bit wild here for a second. So we can kind of, our souls can kind of share space. So there's even a part of us where our soul was also on the other side and we're just kind of living this little part of like uh, physically here right now. So it's quite possible that there's a part of him that is living another life while his soul from this life is still kind of holding on to the other side as well. Oh, I should have gotten high for this. <laughs> I, 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 it's like a little, um, it's, we're not totally meant to understand it. Like we're meant to be here, live this life, like in its entirety by all means and like see where it goes. Um, we don't have to get so heady about it but whenever anyone asks me that it's like this weird thing that just circulates around my mind and I sh- there's a lot of people that share this opinion as well but this most simple way of putting it is there's even a part of our soul that's on the other side and I actually think this is a little bit of how I'm doing what I'm doing is I'm kind of talking with my soul who's talking with like everyone else so then she's like bringing back the information to me cool pan um and well I was just gonna say, I'm gonna like should we Open the door. And- yeah, well, yeah. Let's, let's, let's talk about yeah. Sasha here. Right yeah, now. let's go. Yeah. Well, how about Brittany? Do you want to pick one of the women that you have questions for? Is there like a someone that you're kind of more attracted to? Well, I mean, as an architectural historian and as a historic preservationist who's always trying to get people excited about old buildings, <laughs> favorite. Yes, I. 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 I it res- Nell's story resonates with me a lot because she was she they she even wanted to take the furnishings out of this house and put it in the Joseph Madigo house. She wanted to start living in the Joseph Madigo house so that people may maybe they'd visit if there's a real hostess at the door. You know, she was just trying to get people excited about an old building, and I feel like I t- try and do that every day of my life. And so, her, t- you know, having that exhaustion take her life, and then I, you know, her baby died a year later yeah. you know I, I i don't know i would love to connect with her if that's something that you're capable you know i think it's perfect because she had brought up before i came here the two the two child spirits i would be here with one of them i believe just to meet the young man and then like a baby child spirit. okay so it's perfect i think she's already kind of like trying to make that connection you said her name is now 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 okay i'm just gonna close my eyes for a little bit but actually if you guys want to close your eyes too and just start taking some deep breaths. And it is, wild as it sounds, just imagine a bridge between you and the house, just any part of the house. I'm kind of imagining it between me and the windows behind me. And then just take a few more deep breaths and imagine that bridge getting shorter and shorter and you and the energy of the house are becoming closer. 
And then just knowing that the intention is to connect in with now. And then you guys can open your eyes when you want. I'm going to keep mine closed just for a little bit. And she's coming in a little bit closer. Okay. This is lovely. She comes in right behind me. Usually when I get a guide, uh, when someone comes in right behind me, they usually mean like guide to, and it's funny that we're connecting it with the house. So it kind of means like guide to house. Like she would kind of still be here, um, helping people navigate the house, like show people around very, um, uh, hostess, like very warm, very welcoming. Just close my eyes for a little bit. Okay, first. And then I got this information before I came, before I came, um, which would be a little bit of, and I wasn't able to quite place it at the time, but to be a little bit of, hey, the um, kind of like the house that rises from the ashes, a little bit like the phoenix energy. I think that's how she likes people to look at the house um, with that sort of phoenix energy, like a house that rises from the ashes. So she's seen it uh, turned into its full glory is how she puts it. Like she likes the renovations. Um, she likes the remodeling. She likes when people are like putting things very intentionally into the right places is how she puts it. And I'm looking at Dr. Schaefer right now, cause it's kind of like a thank you to you for making sure that things are mm, set in the right places. Not that it would have been the exact way she would have done it, <laughs> um, but she likes the intention behind it. She likes a lot of the colors going on. I'm going to see what's going on there. Okay, hold on. She, um, I mean, okay. She brings in her baby a little bit, just letting us know, like, hey, look who I'm with. Like, baby's here with me. All good. she would understand there to be like a, sp a space where she would have um, like a little cradle or a space where she would have like kept the baby kind of beside her for a little bit it actually feels as though there's like an antique piece that dr schaefer might know of of like a antique cradle i'm gonna leave that with you just in case that makes sense at some point okay and when I talk about the woman who's kind of like, uh, um, she goes, there's other women that were more involved in the community than she was that would have lived here is how she puts it. But she also wants to be recognized as one of them. Um, um, let's see, hold on. She calls it a little bit more insular. She's like more, uh, she doesn't like reach out to the community as much, like doesn't get everyone as involved as much as the other women, but that she would be curating all of the things and like setting up all the things um, so that when people are ready, that they're going to be here and ready and ready and ready is how she puts it. Okay. And then kind of just as like a last little final note she says therefore that's why I'm kind of the person she goes people don't notice my energy as much because it really does fill up the whole house it fills up the whole house she's like I'm the first one that's there when people come in the front door like I'm the welcomer and that's kind of like where we would might feel her energy the most it's going to be really light and present and um welcoming so we might just not be aware of it because when you open that front door of South Battery, it's immediate eye candy and you just want to like look everywhere and have it feels really good. She's like, I'm the one helping with that feeling. Um, so that's where she kind of likes to hang out, where she likes to put her energy. Do you have any questions for her? Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> that's like the hardest question I ask anyone I know. Um, or do either of you? Yeah. And see, well, so she wore herself out working. She feels really good now is how she puts it. It's yeah. almost like we have abundant energy and spirits. Uh, we don't we have a body anymore, so we don't feel that tiredness or that mental weariness. Um, so she's it's neutral, though. It's like kind of imagine that day where you get everything done, but you don't feel super caffeinated and you don't really get all that tired, but somehow you've gotten the most done that day. It's kind of how she feels. I mean, it's all good. It's almost like it's the reward. Yeah. That, you know, is, she's feeling that. And so it kind of makes the work seem smaller. But yes, the reward is so grand. Yeah. 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 Can, that's the, can you ask her how she felt about April 21st, 1920? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Brittany. How do you to say it? I'm just going to keep my eyes closed for a minute. It is interesting, the feeling that you get in this house, because it is so bright and light. I mean, it feels very good in this property to me. You know, yeah. sometimes grand homes 
they just are overwhelming or daunting or dark. And this, this, yes, this does not have that feeling at all. It's curated by a lot of women before us. <laughs> Is that the date where there's lots of dissolving happen, happening? Is that, she keeps kind of talking about that a little bit. Dissolving. dissolving. Yeah, dissolving. Um, is that the date that she moves out of the house? No, that's the date that the preservation society is founded in the house. So oh, that she okay. brings both okay. together. Oh, good, good, good. That's good. That's okay. You can be opposite of that. Hold on. I'm going to see what she's saying with it just to make sure. Oh, perfect. Okay. This is what I mean by dissolving of the houses and it's no longer like, um, I'm going to see if we can understand this as best as she can put it. No longer like a single house. And she's like, it's, it's dissolving kind of like what it was and it's going to emerge into i feel like that's kind of like that rising of the phoenix feeling too because she's like it's not just um how how everything has come full circle for the house but she also kind of recognizes that some of that the that sort of phoenix energy it has to do with some of the things that she did as well is how she puts it so that feels as though she's like i kind of start start the ashes that's how she puts it um uh, then let's see Then she just loves how far it's reached. That's how she puts it. She like kind of points behind me, which is where I kind of connected in with her. And she just kind of like points to all of the battery, how far it's reached, and then like into Charleston. And I had Gully that said, was talking about preservation, stuff on that. Okay, but then you help me out with this part. So did I hear you right? So does she help start that, or is there somebody else that helps start that? It's her and Susan Pringle broth. Okay. I know that you said that in the previous episode. But my historian mind isn't quite there. Really? All right, it's kind of sweet. She's glad that she gets to take uh, some recognition with that now. She's like, I, she does enjoy being recognized in that way. Um, she sees how she's recognized in it in the, in the ways that not just this house, but the ways in which even new builds would try to replicate some of that Charleston style is how she puts it. So she's even kind of watching over some of those decisions and helping people make decisions if someone's doing a new build and wants to make it look a little bit more like what it would have looked like. And she kind of pops in as people's guides in those moments, like make this decision, not that decision. Okay, hold on. But yeah, yeah, she's she's proud of that date is what it feels like. It feels good. It feels for whatever reason, she does keep giving me the word dissolving, but it's like a, it feels good, kind of like when you're letting everything go, and therefore the new can come in. Yeah. Well, um, good. were you going to ask? Yeah, well, I was going to ask, so we um, had the the story of the suicide um, in the tallest staircase in Charleston, but I want to talk about some of the features of this home that make it very unique. Okay. Um, so Dr. Schaefer has restored as best he could to period pieces, mm -hmm. which is very unique. Mm -hmm. The etchings behind us, books in the library, all that stuff, the tile floor, the staircase. But what, what, what do you want to add? No, I think it's now it's that collective, the collective energy and the collective ambiance that, you know, the current homeowner has has cured it. I mean, it, he tirelessly restored the Italian mosaic tile downstairs. They revealed the gilded detailing on um, on the first floor, second floor if you're counting the basement or the ground floor. Um, and then he's taken what the descriptions of what people had when they visited the house from the late 19th century on, and he's tried to curate that same ambiance. So like the rare books, the etchings, the the furniture we have a lot of documentation of what this space looked like and i think that's like the best when you have a homeowner that wants to actually use that to then kind of put the energy back in this house and maybe you agree is that i think when people work with the energy and with the grain of the structure the house comes alive in a, in a way we never even imagined and that that could mean spirited or that could just mean the well, how you feel when you're in the house is that you're going with it as opposed to against it and you look at the staircase and it has that scroll new post from the mid 19th century, but then you have this great mansard with these incredible uh, double views of the 1870s and um, the ballrooms, everything has had its its kind of, you know, even the 1920s of, of them, they actually met in the dry rooms, which was crazy in, in, the, in the front of the room, not the ballroom for the Preservation Society. And we have a description of 
the little girls and Emma calls little girls and the types of dresses they wore and how they stood in the corner and was just listening to the women and how they ate mocha cakes and how their grandmother was in the corner of the room on a rocking chair just listening who I think now called um Pringle was it either her mother or her husband's mother was another woman that kind of went like a Sarah Simons under the radar but was this generation of widows that kind of like brought in this cultural resurgence of the early 20th century and so we know who was standing on the fireplace we know what the fireplace looked like and using those descriptions and then having he- walking into the structure and kind of experiencing it in the same way has been such a treat in this kind of um, last campaign of ownership that we're under now. So you mentioned a bunch of letters that were left behind. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about that? Sure. So this is like that were left intentional. A lot. Of, I, one of the best parts of my job is getting the phone call and either it's someone saying we found something or I got something for you. And Dr. Schaefer called and said, you know, we do, we have this shoebox of letters in um, a closet. And I was like, that's like perfect. And you can get primary resources and you can get kind of like people's own words. That's the best in kind of unraveling a house history. And so it wasn't just one shoebox. It was, I think there were three or four. And it was all the Pringle family. So it was Ernest Pringle and now McCall Pringle and their children. And it went all the way up through World War II. So it's documenting Nell's death, it's documenting Ernie's death, and it's documenting their journey with this house and the financial troubles. And we were really able to personify and humanize the walls through what was going on in this house. You can see that, you know, Ernest Pringle wanted his children to go to very, you know, like Harvard and Yale and Ernie, the other child, was doing his best, and he finally got in, but he wasn't doing right. He dropped out. And so you can see the journey and even him of what led him to that faithful day in the late 1930s of, unfortunately, you know, dying by suicide. So those have probably been the biggest jackpot of this entire house history journey of getting their words. So it's more like diary entries. Well, yeah, because they're... I think they, they had many children, and I can't off the top of my head think of how many. I want to say four or five maybe six. And so they're all in different points of life. And so they're all writing to each other. Um, you have their oldest son actually going, I think he was into the Navy. You have Dunk, who is Duncan Pringle. She's getting her uh, medical degree, which is as, as a woman in the early 20th century. You have the two other daughters marrying and moving away and then coming back. And so it, it's their family communicating. And a lot of it is from their father. I don't, we don't have too many from now, which Kind of disappointing, but and he's always kind of giving the financial status as a right? Yeah, I don't know. She's like, How about the Joseph Matty go out? I know what I got to do, but it always starts off like the financial status of the family, like, right, here's where we're at, you know. And then he gets into very, um, sometimes Bible verse. So you could just tell what, what, what is special to that. How does he communicate his financial status? He's just telling his children, like, I have this bonds in this bank, well, we're doing good on those dividends, like, and I don't even know if the, the children maybe they are understanding that, I'm not sure, but. This is also a time where, again, they're taking out a mortgage on this house that they can they can save the Matabo house. Um, they're they're literally giving everything in the name of preservation, mm-hmm. and they don't have much. You, uh, you have to remember, you know, in early 20th century, even after the Civil War, Charleston really didn't regain its wealth. The Charlestonians didn't regain their wealth until what we call kind of that uh, Charleston Renaissance period, or even World War II, when People are starting to come in and rent these buildings that are Navy sailors, and they're starting to get a little bit more of their of their money back. These these houses were not as pristine as they are today, and so it's a big old house, a lot of upkeep. You when was and I we may have talked about this on the last podcast, but when was Charleston? Because he took a nap. <laughs> it's in its that, prime because it was once the wealthiest city or in fourth wealthiest. So. Uh, or excuse me, fourth largest city, but yes, probably was at one point from the mid 18th century till I would say about the 1840s ish. So we have about um, 17 a century, I would say, from about 1740s till about 1840s was really Charleston's heyday when Charleston is on the map as one of the wealthiest, if not the wealthiest, colony or or city mm-hmm. in in the United States. Um, we, you have their cultural leaders. They are setting the tone for science, architecture, fashion, music. Now, again, we always have to remember that their wealth is, is coming from um, the institution of slavery. So it's, it's, 
it's a very layered and complicated century. Mm-hmm. But that is when they're in their pride. And that is when you are seeing buildings like this right. being erected. So it's almost like this house is almost almost like the late last generation of, of true wealth. Because as we get into the mid-19th century, you start to see northern industrialism kind of begin to come into play. You start to get a lot of tension with the North and the South beginning to build on how the South is still maintaining their economy. People are maybe investments aren't coming in as as much and as through and and the agricultural systems of the low country in the south start to decline the largest homes in charleston which are surrounding us basically Mm -hmm. here on the battery meeting street um east bay street what period does that span in terms of the ones that are like i'm saying over ten thousand square feet Okay, so you can have mansions on now. South Battery is a little bit. You have a couple different eras here on South Battery. You have everything from the late 18th century up until the 1850s. On East Battery, though, that is in that kind of 1830s, 40s time period. Most of them, and that is where I mean, the it's the wealth is just oozing. And again, it's almost like it could be that last generation of grand mansions and then of course as we hit the late 20th century you're getting northern investors coming in after the civil war like lathers and he's making this house even bigger and so many of the houses you may see that maybe bigger than those long the battery that could be well from other places where in the end right okay so dr shaver was telling us that there have been many sightings of someone in a confederate he had a form <laughs> let's let's talk to that guy <laughs> <laughs> So oh, wait, it, from what I understand, he hangs out in room eight. So there's people that have come and stayed in the carrot house out back. Um, Mayor Lotus Cook it this weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a different perspective. Maybe he'll like come in real these eight. Um, but yeah, I think a few people have seen him in room eight. And my understanding is that they'll only see his torso. So he tends to be headless and like less and it's just his torso. And then... Um, coming in with that confederate uniform uh i think it's usually in gray and kind of felty and those sort of textures to it so i know that there's been a few people that have seen and heard him and then there's another ghost in room 10 who everyone calls the gentleman ghost and i think that um dr Schaefer's intuition tells him and i it feels right to me too that it's um richard why would he be out there I don't know. I mean, like this was where and this was in jam, you know. <laughs> yeah, in the May House. I think rumor has it that he really likes women. So, oh my God. Okay, I did not want to like <laughs> smudge this man's name, but I'm going to please to sleep with the slaves by Quinn, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, right. We have to cut that out. I okay. think <laughs> Lizzie. Sorry. <laughs> 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 <That's bad. laughs> um, uh, who knows Spiky would be? <laughs> yeah, that made it be. The, and that's, but by the time he's occupying this house, that outbuilding may not have been inhabited by anybody. I mean, it'd be inhabited by his servants that he's bringing from other places. So this is after the Civil War. Uh, I, but I don't know. I don't know what he'd be. I would think that a man of his stature and his class, he wouldn't dare step a foot back there where his servants are. And remember that Charleston's side guards and now these beautiful gardens, they were work yards. You know, now there were some formal gardens within certain areas of the, you know, of, of, of the yards, even in the 18th century or 19th century. But for the most part, they were all working yards with stables and horses. So it's maybe like dried glimpses. Yeah. yeah. Or it could mean the newness of it, too. Like, like they're not necessarily in the same time frame, right? So they see, hear, and know everything that's currently going on. And so it could just be like, well, what's this extension um, going on out here? And uh, curious about that and then visiting the people for whatever reason in room 10. Yeah. So can we talk to... Yeah, let's... Let's either listen. Let's me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's see. I'm going to close my eyes for a little bit. Do you guys have a preference? Let's hope Brendan choose. Yeah, hey, no, I want to know what this this soldier's doing back there. I mean, because the energy, Charleston was booming with, you know, Union and Confederate soldiers at certain times. Okay, and why he comes with just his torso? Yeah, that would be, I would like to know that. It's an interesting thing. Okay, I'm just going to kind of settle in. I might just be quiet just for a second. And... 
Okay. Uh, it's a little bit funny. There's a little bit of something of like, well, the torso, I, this is from him. The torso idea is kind of perpetuated because there would have been somebody that would have like seen the, like just perceived the torso for whatever reason. And then he's like, let's go with that. The hen of faith. Um, he's got a sense of humor. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, my friend. I might as well. Yeah, a little bit funny. Not that he enjoys scaring people, but there's a little bit of well, whoever kind of books this room and has heard these stories before, kind of, kind of is there for the scares sort of thing. So he's like, I can be an entertainer if you want me to be. Um, I can understand Tim. He kind of shows me his his full self it's because my imagination is doing it. i'm asking him to come in in a different way so that i can better communicate with him it's kind of hard to talk to a stomach um i'm just asking him to kind of come in it also feels as though there would have been something with the war uh he's actually telling a part of this story with that too it's like there would have been something with the war where um, quite possibly he that's like how he would have passed and that's like kind of other his extremities would have been quite injured um, so his burial kind of would have been centered on his torso, if that makes sense. And I know that sounds gruesome, but that's just kind of how he makes me feel. Okay. Mm -hmm. He feels quite young. He just gives me like the number 18, like he would have been quite young when he passes. I'm kind of asking like why he would be around this house and this house. Mm -hmm. It just feels close to where the action was, which I know where we are in the battery. Brittany, you can probably talk more about that than I can. Um, but this would have been in a war zone or in a... Does that make sense? Um, it would have probably been centered a little bit... Well, yeah, it could have been. Charleston was bombarded for over 500 days. So Union, the Union was out in the harbor, and they, for 500 days, between 1863 and 1865, they just, every day, boom, 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 they threw shells into the city. It was mostly centered in the wharf dock where, you know, Charleston's economy was centered. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the dwellings along the East Battery, the richest cotton merchants really in the city. So, um, but we do have cannonballs lodged in all sorts of houses around here. Okay. And then would, I feel as though this is like a place of retreat or like a, um, that's just kind of what he's giving me. He's kind of shows me this pattern that he would have done to kind of get back into this house. Um, and then he just shows me, it, uh, either like, um, away from an infirmary, uh, but it was like close enough. Like I'm just trying to get close enough. That's how it feels. Um, and it feels as though for whatever reason, this is where he would have been taken care of actually, like wounds would have been dressed here. That's how he put it. Yeah. Um, we know the house was vacant. We think the house was vacant. Oh, I joined the civil war. Yeah. That's okay. I'm just gonna put the sun on back. Oh, they good. Are they good. I don't. There's something then with that, like in furry, like either coming, coming, coming back here, hiding back here, or something with like being taken care of near here, something like that. Um, but I'm not sure about his like exact connection to this house. Actually, Bert, there you go. There is no exact connection to this, to this house specifically. It doesn't feel like he lives here. Um, I know that you said it's vacant, but I'll just say that um, there's something like either like a safe haven for a little bit or there's something about hiding back here and kind of being taken care of back here. Yeah. He said back here, so it would have been kind of behind the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, yeah, this thing would have been like this huge, I mean, it's brick, right? And so it probably would have been this huge stalwart, you know. Did it sustain any damage? Well, we have a photograph right after the Civil War. It did not look like it to sustain too much. We do, I mean, it, it looked ravaged in a sense of, you know, shutters were falling. I think it was more neglect, though. I think it hadn't been, and I, I, I the surrounding area, this this South Battery, um, I'd have to do a little bit more research to figure out specifically about each building. I do know East Battery got a lot mm -hmm. of that activity. And maybe it's because this is kind of shielded, um, and the harbor's kind of more that way, but right after the Civil War, it looked as if they were just cosmetic changes that needed to happen. Not necessarily holes or roofs or anything, but with that could the angle of the photograph. What about what about the gentleman? Go missed little ghost. Let's see. When I went in on like the word gentleman, I actually kind of get more of um the young man that lived in this house that we were talking about, uh, the Pringle. 
Mm -hmm. son. And then whenever I say that, he kind of comes a little bit closer. So if we're going to talk about a gentleman, it kind of feels a little bit more like him. I'm going to focus in on the guy that tends to visit rooms in the back. Then He feels like calm and good. I mean, I know that that's how he is on the other side as well. Like calm and good. Just so everyone knows. It's looking calm and good. Um and curious is just how it feels like i'm gonna go back there i'm just kind of being curious 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 okay hold on all right we're gonna we're gonna go okay off into a little bit of a tangent here what he gives me is actually being a little bit more of like a creative person and a little bit more artistic is how he puts it and there's something about like being in the back of the house, uh, which I would assume would be kind of near the gardens and stuff and doing some like paintings or drawings back there is how he puts it. So there's some interest in the buildings that are back there. It doesn't feel as though that's where he lives or really has that much to do with it other than he's just kind of getting like a better view and then mm -hmm. they're looking around um, and enjoys being in those rooms. Uh, I, a part of that is because there's already some stories that are built around room 10. So there's already a little bit of that awareness of like, oh, these people are booking this room and they know of my existence. So they're going to kind of show themselves again and again and again. Uh, but yeah, I don't know if you would know Brittany, but I'm going to put that out there. Um, Did he live here? Yeah, he actually feels like he has way more to do with the house than the man in room 8. Mm -hmm. Like way more. Uh, it's like there's a lot of visiting artists, but here, you know. Like I, people that came in and yeah. Well, you have, I mean, you have artists during Lather's time period coming and, you know, attending events. You have an artist, his name is Winston Churchill, but it's not the Winston Churchill. <laughs> an artist in the early 20th century, um, the same name as Winston Churchill. He comes and he stays and he has a stint here. Uh, he's drawing structures. Um, but... I don't know if any of the permanent residents. That's okay. It's more of like, and that's okay. It can be like an artist residency. I mean, that's, I think that that's perfect. If that's, he's, when I'm going in and I'm like honing in on like, well, how are you different from any of the other spirits that are around? He gets, he's like, well, you have to talk about how artistic I am and what I'm doing. Um, and then especially that little part about, well, I'm up here in room 10 because it's a better view, like would have a better view of different things. I think that that's, um, to work with. I think that's cool. That's, you know, that, that there's, I'm sure, I mean, you have people like Alfred Huddy coming here. I mean, you just, that's, during the Charles Renaissance, this place was full of artists. Yeah. Full. I mean, you have Elizabeth O'Neill Verner. So wait, this is a man though. Well, I love that you, I wrote down Elizabeth at, when you were talking about Sarah Simmons. Um, so timeline wise, if that works out, but sometimes they just kind of pop in as we're like thinking of someone else. I know Elizabeth is a really common name, but. Uh, there's an Elizabeth in in the house around the house for sure, um, but sometimes if there's multiple artists and there's multiple people that would have had something to do with the house, and we start talking about the Renaissance, and you're telling us that there's so many people that would have lived here, they're like, okay, cool, me too, yeah, me too, um, all wanting not meeting, but just recognizing themselves a little bit that they would have had some resonance with the house as well. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Unless there's going to be a part two. They rush for it. That's that clip. So seriously. It's when you were talking about him out there, I was like, sounds like a Renaissance man. Um, you know, and, but I didn't even know what the timeline was. But Well, Sarah Simmons would have been before. She dies in the 19 teens. And um, so the Charleston Renaissance really kicks off after her death into the 1920s, 30s, and then World War II. And. That's where you're starting to get artists from all over the country coming down here and and using Charleston as inspiration. And then you have a lot of Charleston-born artists that are getting national attention. And those are the types of, I mean, the Gibbs Museum of Art always has exceptional exhibits on on these individuals. And that is um, Alice Ravenel, Hugh G. Smith, Alfred Honey, um, Elizabeth O'Neill Verner. And those are the same people that are in this house on April 21st, 1920, in the creation of the Preservation Society of Charleston. So they're heavily you know, late to this house, but they're all their, their artistry is so different. One's etchings, one's watercolors, you know, one's oils. So it, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I think the the one maybe it would bring ten would maybe have a little bit of something to do. Like if you can imagine kind of being up in that corner and and having the view of like the angle of the house, but then also the view of the balcony, like out to the gardens, but kind of like right tucked in that corner. Um, like it's at carriage house wasn't there. You can almost like put a ladder up there and get like a aerial view of the gardens. Um, it kind of feels as though somebody would be more like sketching that, uh, paint, painting that, sketching that, painting that a little bit more of that form of artwork than the other one. So if that helps narrow it down at any point, okay. You can just kind of like update it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, a lot of these artists were again in this house and what, and maybe Nell will like us reading this poem, but there was a poem written by Nell um, in a book called Tall Houses. It was written by Elizabeth Ferrer Hamilton and it talks about her journey. Oh, look, Susan Franco Frost too. You can't just be Nell. Anyway. Um, and I, can I read this? Yeah. And see if this resonates. It says, Nell, Pringle speaks and it says, don't forget about me. I put my, I'm going to cry. No, I'm not. I put my heart in. <laughs> don't forget about me. I put my heart into this house. It was defeated, doomed to be demolished. All crinolines gone, all legs and pantaloons packed in trunks and then thrown out, but no one to, to come again in powder curl, curls and snowy frill to stand in front of tall gilt mirrors lit by candlelight to talk of justice and the country's will. Four families crowded to a floor, wings coating ripped and all stairwells burned, out of mantles hidden, deep in grime, awaiting the bulldozer's demolition. I, Nell McCall Pringle, saved it. I signed the note for preservation. Ahead of my time, I was. Voices were raised in support, but echoed fruitlessly. I saved this house. Oh, that is good to yeah. Me too. Dang, because her one of her things she told you, well, you don't forget about me, right? Like I help. But people have. That's the thing. And doing this, okay, I shouldn't say people have. It's just that Susan Pringle Frost has gotten all the spotlight attention. Mm -hmm. And there was another woman who who did just as much, if not more, from and I mean, tore her up. Now Susan Pringle Frost may have felt the same way again. I don't. I haven't read her specific words about this specific thing, but. I mean, when you think about women of the early 20th century, I mean, in all history, they're, they're being subsumed under the rights and, and umbrellas of their husbands and the male counterparts. And when you look at Charleston, Charleston really is the way it is because of the women of the early 20th century. And it's people like Nell McCall Pringle. And it, things like this exist. I, I love this because it, it we... It helps us it not. It says everything. Yeah. 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 It says everything that you said about her. So you can start the Remember Nell campaign. Yeah. Oh, like someone needs to write a book. And the It'll be you. Be me. I'm kind of it's like, going to be you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, but, well, that, that's, I mean, is there anything else that y'all want to add? And this is, is this? an etching by Elizabeth O'Neill Werner. I don't know if this is like resonates with you. I mean, she, again, she was probably a, a friend, not probably was a friend. A contemporary of Nell McCall Pringle, Susan Pringle Frost, she was certainly in this house, eating, drinking, scheming, making change. But that's her art. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I love that. And I love that idea of, um, like, even in her poem, she kind of mentions burning and that idea of Nell being kind of the phoenix that rises from the ashes and this re-remembering of her. It's going to be so beautiful. I know that it means a lot to her. And thank you for sharing that. I think that that's wonderful. Creed. Yeah, and all of the artists that have been here, just making sure that we get that last little word in. My king character too, we've been here too. Is there anyone else that feels like they need some recognition or just want to say something? Yeah, I can see for sure. Okay, it's gonna. All right, we're gonna see how this bounces off. And should it come leave us on a wild goose chase? I think that's okay. Maybe listeners can write in if they know any information about it. There's kind of been this energy since the beginning, and I got some of this uh, before, before, before we came together today, and I'm just letting it sink in a little bit more. Well, like, this would feel more like a female energy, again, it's like a female energy kind of coming forward, and it could be someone that um, we've already talked about that you know about, and I'm just going to kind of see where it goes, but they would have, 
either had a relative or um, I'm not very good at my history, so you have to explain me that in like timeline wise. So it would have had something to do with like the Titanic, um, like either like a survivor of the Titanic or something along those lines that would have ended up like here in this house. Does that make sense to you? Um, are you, well, at that same time, Titanic was that 1912. Great question. I, the, um, Google it. Don't worry. I, mean, <laughs> I should know it. Eight, no, April 12th. No, that was the first choice of the war. Okay. Um, April 1912. Okay. April 1912, right. Okay. Uh, Sarah Simmons' daughter dies at sea, not in a Titanic. Okay. But she dies in ni 1908 on a boat at sea. It's, that's it. I mean, so it's like, what, so what spirits do on the other side is they're using the references that I can get. So they're like, and I'm like, I don't really want to mention <laughs> so down. Um, but yeah, it's like my job so we get it. to say it. Yeah. yeah, and so that's perfect. Like, so I say the reference of the Titanic and then there's like a story that lines up with it that's similar enough. It's absolutely perfect. And so it's a feeling of that woman just wanting to be recognized as well, recognized as well. Um, I don't know if you know any more about her, but it just kind of feels like really quick and easy like that. Well, sh we know that Sarah Sim is, um, like, uh, we know she customs a Tiffany glass window at St. Michael's Church for her. So you can go and actually, you can see it's when you first walk in, it's on the left. And there's a beautiful Tiffany glass window of a, I think it's either of Easter. Hold on, I'll let it, oh, here it is. It's of, um... Excuse me, sorry, let me just get this. No, and we can see the steeple from here. Yes. Okay, so she dies at sea, and so her mother, Sarah Simmons, designs a Tiffany glass window. She, Sarah Simmons is a widow at this time, and it's depicting Easter Sunday um, because she does die in April. And the newspaper begins to kind of chronicalize Sarah because she's such a big uh, person and influential. And a couple of years later, the newspapers say that Sarah Simmons has reemerged in society as she withdrew years following after her daughter's death at sea. So we know that she kind of comes in and close to her house, does not leave, and then reemerges um, as a force. Mm. But that Tiffany Glass window does survive commemorating her daughter's death at sea. Wow. Beautiful. Yeah. A Titanic. Cool. <laughs> no, that's okay. I think that honestly didn't the the reference. And there's also like a little tidbit about uh, the 20 house bathtub. I think they they're trying to say like the 20 is in the address here and then the house bathtub. And there being something I like with the renovations. Um, maybe Dr. Schaefer would know more about that. Um, but something funny about the 20 house bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so maybe that one might remain like a little bit of a mystery i'm not sure if i'm going to get anything well there was a dating house across from the white boy car stuff still that was in the mid 19th century they they're adding a bathhouse right across but that that was for um, people at white point gardens too so. okay i mean tony house that tony house maybe maybe a bathtub a house with 20 bathrooms <laughs> um yeah there might just be something to that it's kind of like uh trickling on the tip of my mind but i don't think it's going to sink in without like the right thing to bounce it off on but maybe that'll be something fun for the listeners to kind of chime in on mm -hmm. yeah well anything else you ladies would like to add no i i just say you know next time you walk down Whiteway Garden, take a look. Take a look at this big guy because it's 20 South Dodge. South Dodge. It's historic, and you also have the opportunity to stay here. And I want to thank Dr. Schaefer for allowing us to record the podcast in his home. This is his primary residence as well. And thank you, ladies, so much for joining us. If you can just tell everybody where to find you once more. Sure. So you can find me on Instagram where I share all sorts of discoveries and things we fell along the way. Um, it's at B V Lavelle Tula, B as in boy, B as in Victor, and then Lavelle Tula, which is my last name. 
and my firm, BVL Historic Preservation Research, where I do this work on house histories and uncovering the stories of old buildings. You can Google that, bvlhpr.com. And you can find me at on Instagram at Haley Low Fennel, two N's, two L's, and that's also my website. And then I also have a podcast called House Guest. You can find it on Apple or anywhere that you like to listen. And it's on Instagram at houseguest underscore in the holy city. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe, and we will see you next time.